Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for turning in today. Uh, I will begin today's press conference by providing our weekly data and modeling update. Uh, I will then be followed by Mike Harrington, the Commissioner at the Department of Labor, who will be joining us virtually to provide an update on the work search requirement. Following uh, Commissioner Harrington, Deputy Secretary Samuelson will be joining us to update us on Vermont's vaccination progress. And then, of course, Dr. Levine will be providing his uh, weekly health update. And then finally, uh, Governor Scott will then be joining us following his White House call uh, with fellow governors regarding the pandemic. Uh, this week's report is again filled with plenty of good news. It shows that Vermont continues to emerge from a very long uh, and cold winter that saw record COVID-19 deaths, hospitalizations, and cases. But now our cases are in a steady retreat, and over the last seven days, Vermont has had the second fewest deaths and hospitalizations on a per capita basis in the country. Further, Vermonters continue to step up and get vaccinated, and we have already met our May 1st vaccination goal under the Vermont Forward Plan. This week, Vermont is reporting 504 new COVID-19 cases, 293 fewer than last week, and down 720, uh, 727 cases from an all-time high on April 5th. Our seven-day average dropped 34% this week, and the rate is down 61% since April 1st. We've also reported under 100 new COVID-19 cases for nine straight days. The first time we have done that in nearly nine, uh, five months. And again, it's important to note that Vermont is seeing these large decreases, even though we continue to lead the country in per capita testing. The dramatic drop in cases that we're experiencing this, this month was only matched by the similar decrease that occurred last April when the seven day case rate decreased 82% that month. However, unlike last April, when we had to close schools, close colleges, and close businesses, we are working our way out of this through a life-saving vaccine that, and that we anticipate that trend to continue to finally end the pandemic. But to do so, it's critical for everybody to step up and get vaccinated. Cases are continuing to decrease in every age group, with the younger cases continuing to fall the most. Uh, with cases among 10 to 19 year olds down 70 percent so far this month and cases for those 20 to 29 down 60 percent so far this month similarly covid 19 cases are remaining relatively low on campuses across the state this week there were 52 higher education covid 19 cases a slight uptick from the 47 that were reported last week but still down significantly from the four straight weeks of over 100 cases that were reported uh, through March and early April. Cases have also generally improved across the state with 13 of Vermont's 14 counties seeing their case rates fall, including a 42% drop in the Northeast Kingdom. The only county with an increase was Lamoille County, but still that was very slight with an increase of only six cases compared to last week. It's certainly encouraging uh, that we see case rates dropping across Vermont, and this is especially encouraging in the Northeast Kingdom, which has generally seen higher case rates over the past few weeks. However, as you can see from this slide, neighboring counties in New Hampshire and Maine are not experiencing that same trend. In fact, neighboring Coas County has the most active cases in the Northeast, and several of the neighboring counties in Maine are close behind. Last November, we saw trends worsen in northern New Hampshire and then spill over into the kingdom. So we do want to provide an extra word of caution for those living and working in the kingdom to protect themselves, for them to get tested if they visit these neighboring counties, and then ultimately, and most importantly, to get vaccinated so that we no longer have to worry about these outbreaks that pop up in neighboring states that have the potential of impacting our daily lives. With the recent favorable trends, our uh, updated modeling forecasts a very optimistic outlook for the weeks ahead. With cases expected to decrease, uh, and with cases expected to even get on, the, on a daily basis back down into the single digits uh, in the month of June. However, as always, this will only materialize if we all do our part. 
we follow the public health guidance, and we all step up to get vaccinated, uh, and we uh, do that as quickly as we can. Turning to hospitalizations, our rates continue to be stable, and they've even shown signs of decreasing as well, with the overall trend decreasing 7% this week and down close to 10% over the past 14 days. Looking at the demographics of our hospitalizations, we can see that uh, those over 70 continue to make up fewer and fewer of those requiring hospitalization. And as a result, the average age of those requiring hospitalization has been on a steady decrease over the past four months. With improving case rates and improving vaccination coverage, we anticipate seeing our hospitalization rates fall more significantly in the very near future. And with fewer vulnerable Vermonters contracting COVID-19 and requiring hospitalization, we are also thankfully seeing our fatality rates continue to stay low and even decreasing. Sadly, 14 Vermonters so far this month have lost their lives to the virus, but thankfully that number is trending down from the past few months. And we're also forecasting that during the month of May, this decrease will continue with as few as five and as many as 15 deaths estimated for the month of May. Taking a look now at the Vermont Forward Plan, we first want to take a step back and see what the progress has been since April 9th, when the first step in the plan uh, was enacted. As you can see, that 10 to 14 day period uh, following that first reopening step does not indicate any increased uh, viral transmission. In fact, the case rates were going down and they continued to go down uh, during that 10 to 14 day period and in the days subsequent to it as well. And looking forward in the Vermont Forward Plan, we also see that we have met our May 1st goal of having at least 50% of the population vaccinated, uh, standing today under new census data numbers at 51.1%. Uh, and those numbers continue to increase quite steadily, uh, which is good to see. Looking generally at our vaccination progress, we can see that Vermont is a leader in a number of different categories ranking second in the country on doses administered. So that's doses first and second, uh, only behind Connecticut. In terms of the population started and the population fully vaccinated, we rank fourth on that metric. In terms of our, our older Vermonters, our more vulnerable Vermonters, those who have started vaccination, we rank second with an impressive 94.6% of Vermonters having started vaccination. And we also rank first in the country in terms of those 65 and older who are now fully vaccinated, standing at 82.8%. So these numbers are really good and really strong. However, we do want to continue to encourage people uh, that, you know, if you haven't yet made an appointment to do so. Nationally, the, uh, the case rate, the, the vaccination rates have come down a little bit, decreasing about 9% over the last week. In Vermont, we saw our vaccination rates decrease a bit as well, not as dramatically, down 3%. So you are seeing those rates slow. Of course, Johnson & Johnson uh, was just put back online. Uh, a lot of opportunities there to get vaccinated. That is certainly impacting the rate. Uh, but there is now a availability you know, in the short and uh, medium term to get vaccinated. So certainly encouraging Vermonters to do that. Finally, taking a look around the region uh, and looking more closely at the Northeast, aside from those counties that we referenced in Northern uh, New Hampshire and Western Maine, uh, the case rates and the hospitalizations have seen great improvement across New England and the Northeast, with cases down nearly 28 percent compared to last week, and every state in the region seeing a decrease. It's also the lowest number of cases that we've seen in the region since early November, again, all of which is a good sign and a good indication for Vermont uh, as we uh, continue our path forward here over the next few weeks. Now, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Commissioner Michael Harrington. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichet. I want to take a moment this morning to provide Vermonters with an update on some upcoming changes regarding the unemployment insurance program. Uh, Unemployment insurance was created in 1935 with the intention of providing short-term partial wage replacement to individuals who lose employment through no fault of their own until they're able to find re-employment. As part of that program, eligible claimants are required to look for work each week. However, due to the pandemic, Vermont 
work search was suspended in order to ensure the safety of thousands of Vermonters. While the Vermont Forward Plan is in place and moving forward and vaccine distribution continuing at a steady pace, Vermont is moving forward to more normalcy because our health officials feel it is safe to do so. This means more opportunities for Vermonters to return to work or seek new opportunities safely, and we know employers are actively seeking people to fill open jobs. With all of this in mind, the department is announcing today the reinstatement of the work search requirement beginning the week of May 9th. This means individuals still collecting unemployment benefits will be required to conduct a standard work search each week beginning the week of May 9th through the 15th and claimants will need to report those job contacts to the department the following week when they file their claim in order to remain eligible for unemployment benefits. As with most things related to the pandemic, this is not a simple activity uh, and one size does not fit all. Because of this, the department will be providing more comprehensive guidance to claimants in both the regular unemployment program and the pandemic unemployment assistance program or PUA over the coming days. With that, here is some basic information. A valid work search consists of three formal job inquiries per week. This includes the submission of an application or a formal request or interview for employment. Because of COVID, business outreach can be done by phone or email, and applications and interviews can be done virtually or by phone. However, claimants must be able to provide proof of outreach upon request by the department. Claimants must report their three job inquiries each week when they file for benefits using the online portal. Claimants who can demonstrate a significant hardship that prevents them from filing online will be provided an alternate means for submitting their work search information. All claimants will be required to set up a job seeker profile in Vermont Job Link, which is the state's online job service application. Claimants are obligated to accept offers of suitable work and refusing an offer of suitable work may result in the loss of benefits. All UI claimants must perform a weekly work search unless they have a COVID qualifying circumstance that exempts them from the work search requirement. Claimants will be required to attest to their work search or to their COVID situation when they file online and they must be able to provide documentation upon request of their COVID qualifying situation. Individuals in the PUA program who are not self-employed, not independent contractors, and not sole proprietors must also perform a weekly work search. Self-employed individuals, independent contractors, or sole proprietors should be prepared to report business engagement efforts and activities should the federal government require it at a future time. Research shows that the longer an individual is removed from the labor force, the harder it is for them to return. And the business community across Vermont continues to report labor shortages across all sectors and industries. So we are hopeful that claimants will be able to find safe and meaningful work relatively easily. Again, our public health experts have worked with employers to minimize risk and ensure individuals can return to the workplace safely. More information on the work search requirement and how it will impact claimants filing weekly claims can be found on the department's website at labor.vermont.gov. We know there are going to be a lot of questions from claimants, so we will be hosting multiple virtual town hall events for those individuals to learn more about the work search requirement, as well as programs the department offers to help Vermonters get back to work. Additionally, the department will be holding a media availability on Wednesday, April 28th, tomorrow from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. More information will be provided in a future media release. I also want to quickly mention fraud, which we know has been a challenge throughout the pandemic, which we have seen a steady increase in over the past few months. To combat this coordinated effort by organized crime, we have implemented a variety of strategies to make it more difficult for fraudsters to file a claim. Because of this, claimants may be asked at different points in the process to validate their identity, and the process for new or first-time claim filers may be extended slightly to account for increased security cross-checks. Remember, if you receive a, any sort of notice from the Department of Labor in the mail about unemployment insurance benefits and you yourself did not file, please report this immediately to the department's fraud unit. This can be done online from the department's homepage or by leaving a detailed message on our fraud tip line at 802-828-4104. That number again is 802-828-4104. 
And now I will turn it over to Jenny Samuelson, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Human Services. Good morning. As you may know, the CDC and the FDA have lifted the pause on the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine following a thorough safety review. The two agencies have determined the following. Use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine should resume in the United States. The FDA and the CDC have confidence that this vaccine is safe and effective at preventing COVID-19. The FDA has determined that the available data shows that vaccines, that this vaccine's known and potential benefits outweigh its known and potential risks in individuals 18 and older. At this time, the available data suggests that the chance of a very rare blood clot occurring is low, but that the CDC and FDA will remain vigilant in continuing to investigate the risks. Healthcare providers administering the vaccine and vaccine recipients or caregivers should review the available COVID-19 vaccine fact sheets that are on the FDA's website at fda.gov. Based on this information, we are excited to announce that the clinics offering Johnson & Johnson vaccine have resumed across the state, including clinics in Chittenden, Addison, Wyndham and Orleans counties. I want to highlight a clinic that is happening today in Barton. This is a drive flu clinic at the Barton Fairgrounds from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. They will be able to accommodate up to 100 drive ups for those individuals who do not have an already scheduled appointment. So bring an eligible friend or family member with you today. There are also clinics with available appointments at the Doubletree in South Burlington tomorrow and Friday at the Middlebury High School. You can sign up at healthvermont.gov backslash myvaccine, or you can call 855-722-7878. If you haven't scheduled an appointment or want an earlier appointment, Additional clinics have been added this week for all three vaccine types. Available appointments exist on weekdays and throughout the coming weekend. I specifically encourage younger Vermonters age 16 and older to make an appointment. As of today, 52% of Vermonters who are 16 or 17 years old and 43% of those between the ages of 18 and 29 have been either vaccinated or registered. As a reminder, if you are unable to make your scheduled appointment, please cancel or reschedule it in the registration system. This will allow other Vermonters the opportunity to get vaccinated. Turning to BIPOC Vermonters, we could, um, we could to, we have been making great progress in this area. As of today, 54% have either been vaccinated or have made an appointment. In terms of our overall progress, Vermont has, has a lot to be a proud of. As Commissioner Pichek mentioned, we are second in the nation for vaccines administered per 100,000 people and first in the nation for those who have completed vaccine and are 65 and older. As of this morning, 324,100 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. Of those, 100,000 100, um, have received their first dose of the vaccine. 224,000 have received their first and last dose. This pandemic has taken a toll on all of us. I can't thank you enough for your dedication flexibility and resilience as we continue to navigate a very challenging time. We're moving in the right direction. If you haven't done so already, please schedule your vaccine appointment to help us all get back to the sense of normalcy as soon as possible. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update.
<clears throat> Good morning. We're glad to see the daily case counts continuing to trend lower. They've now been under 100 each day since April 18th. And on Monday, there was actually a low of 35. Our positivity rate remains low at 1.1%. We're monitoring hospitalizations. Today, they are below 20 at 19, with six in the ICU. I say these all because these are all indicators that we're doing the right things right now, from general prevention to outdoor activities to, most importantly, getting vaccinated. But this does not mean that our work is done here. We still need to keep it up, knowing those variants of the virus are still around us, looking for any opportunity to spread to the next person. We're now at about 60% of Vermonters with at least a dose of the vaccine and more than 40% who've completed vaccination. I continue to be amazed by this progress in just a few short months. I also want to add that some national news reports have raised the issue of people who get their first dose but do not go back for their second. This has not been a major concern in Vermont. According to our data, Fewer than 3% of those who received their first dose have not yet gone for their final dose 14 or more days after they were scheduled to. We're working to bring this relatively small number down even further, and I thank Vermonters for completing vaccination and ensuring they have full protection. And we are pleased to again be able to offer the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, as you just heard with the vaccine having undergone a thorough safety review. As you know, the CDC and FDA had recommended a pause on the use of the vaccine after reports of, a case, of six cases of a rare and severe type of blood clot. During that time, the agencies examined data to assess risk and give information to providers and clinicians so they could manage and recognize these events which require unique treatment. At last report, the federal agencies have confirmed a total of 15 cases of what is known as thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS, including the original six reported cases. All of these cases involve women between ages 18 and 59 with symptom onset between 6 and 15 days after vaccination. 13 of the cases were in women below age 50 for an estimated seven cases per million doses administered in this age group. What this means is the data do suggest that TTS is still very rare. And while instances of TTS can be serious and we all need to be vigilant, when it comes to this risk, the potential risk from COVID-19 is much, much greater. We know that this one-dose vaccine is especially helpful in bringing protection against the virus to certain populations where access may be more difficult, and that it remains an attractive option to people who want the one-and-done approach. In fact, many Vermonters have already signed up for Johnson & Johnson vaccine clinics since we reopened them, including a new drive through option in the Northeast Kingdom that's happening just as we speak which may also be an appealing format for some. We once again have three safe and effective vaccines to offer, and Vermonters can choose a specific clinic when they make an appointment. I don't want to inundate our clinicians with phone calls, but I do encourage anyone with concerns or questions about their health or which vaccine is the right choice for them to contact their health care provider. You deserve to get the answers you need from someone you trust and who knows you well. But I want to emphasize, the most important thing is that you get vaccinated, no matter which vaccine it is. Remember, our progress in vaccination is a core element of the Vermont Forward Plan, allowing us to carefully get together, travel, and visit shops and businesses with fewer restrictions. This plan is carefully tied to population vaccination metrics. The goals we've set are realistic and, as you saw, achievable 
but we still need your help to make this a reality, again, by getting vaccinated. And speaking of easing some restrictions, there are some indications that guidance may be forthcoming shortly from the CDC regarding wearing masks outdoors. It's noteworthy that here in Vermont, we have not been seeing cases arise from the North Beach celebrations recently. As the governor said last week, our team is actively continuing to look at state data and national recommendations, and will of course review any changes. In fact, he may be hearing about this on the White House call right now, so stay tuned. The governor also mentioned on Friday, we have now released summer overnight camp guidance. This is available on the Agency of Commerce and Community Development website. It addresses testing at the time of arrival, symptom screening, masking and other mitigation strategies aligned with the Vermont Forward Plan to allow for a successful and fun camp experience. Something every Vermont kid deserves, especially with all they've been through this past year. Finally, it's been a while since I've told a story. I'd like you to hear from a Vermonter who wanted to share her COVID-19 story. When I encourage people to get vaccinated, I often talk about the more serious outcomes, like hospitalizations and long COVID, which can affect even younger people. So never underestimate the power of this virus. Just look at the severe and often young hospitalized cases being seen in Michigan right now. But I also know it's easy that young people may think that will never happen to them. So here's something else that can happen. Either a loss of taste or smell called anosmia or a distortion of smell known as parosmia. As this Vermonter put it, Amusing to some at first, benign enough compared to the horror stories of severe illness and death. I was lucky. I have full lung capacity. I can work out. I can participate fully in life. No big deal, right? Except now it's been six months. She goes on to say, in fact, having no sense of smell or taste would be a blessing some days. But instead, food smells and tastes take on another means. Meat tastes like what I perceive rotting flesh tastes like. Fruits and vegetables like compost. And most things like I'm eating the contents of an ashtray. Even my cosmetics and shampoos smell putrid. I cannot smell the fresh Vermont spring air and grass or enjoy that morning cup of coffee. She says this is feeling is socially isolating and lonely and has brought her to tears, and she prays it will come back. Now, we all have different things that are important to us, and maybe for you, it's having a meal with family, hanging out with friends at a restaurant or a brewery, or cooking for someone you love. These would not be the same without your taste and smell. I do uh, offer my appreciation to the Vermonter who uh, allowed me to read these comments, and just recall, People weigh risks and consequences in different and often personal ways. So if this could be what motivates someone to get vaccinated, I hope you'll share this story with them. The governor is not yet back from the call, so we'll begin the uh, questions and answers. I know he's on his way down, so Callan, if you've got a quick one uh, for Dr. Lee or someone else, you can start with that. I do have one for Dr. Levine. So Commissioner Pichek um, mentioned that we're seeing um, vaccination rates decreased about 3% uh, last week. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if you expect this number to rise and also, you know, what, what barriers we're still seeing to people accessing vaccines. We hear a lot about hesitancy, but I'm just wondering, you know, what, what sort of barriers are, are you seeing now? Sure. So I'm not sure I'm going to see that number rise necessarily. And I think one of the barriers that we just overcame was there was no Johnson & Johnson. So there are a number of people that I know were just awaiting the return and were very disappointed by the disappearance. So we'll see how that plays into it. Um, in addition, uh, you're going to see uh, larger 
scale vaccination still for the near term future. But as we move past the next couple of weeks, I think you're going to see more events like what are happening in Barton uh, at different types of venues. You're going to see more opportunities for a walk in. You're going to see more opportunities for people to be vaccinated, um, kind of um, bringing the vaccine to them as opposed to asking them to go to the vaccine. So we'll be uh, specifically examining certain populations that we know uh, would probably get vaccinated if it was convenient for them and if we made the vaccine available in a timely way. Uh, we may start looking at other sectors of our work sites and educational sectors as well. Um, and we're hoping very much that the 12 to 15 year old group will receive authorization for vaccinations sometime mid-May or late May. Um, and so we're starting to already do some of the planning for gearing up for that. Uh, again, making the vaccine easy and accessible to them, working with our colleagues in pediatrics uh, for a lot of the awareness setting and education and answering concerns, as well as participating in that aspect of vaccine. Number two for the governor. I bet. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so I just got off the phone with fellow governors, Dr. Fauci, uh, CDC director, Dr. Walensky, White House officials, and others. And here's what we heard. <clears throat> First of all, Dr. Walensky reinforced confidence in the J&J &J vaccines noting the risk of blood clots was extremely rare, about 1.9 in a million chance, and the benefits of preventing COVID far outweigh that rare risk. They mentioned that they would be making some announcements today in regards to new guidance for fully vaccinated people, but did not give us any details on what that would look like. Uh, they didn't want to get out ahead of the president who is having a press conference, I believe, uh, 12.15, so stay tuned. On the supply front, uh, we heard that our Pfizer and Moderna will remain steady um, for the next few weeks, uh, so there was no increase or decrease for the Pfizer and Moderna, and uh, the pharmacies will see a slight, slight uptick for Moderna and Pfizer. For Johnson & Johnson, on top of any supply in the system after the pause, We'll see a small distribution next week, about 800 doses each for the state supply and pharmacies. So in total, we'll receive about 1,800 more doses uh, this week than last week. And we're told uh, that there is uh, also going to be a significant increase in J&J &J, uh, sometime in the next two to three weeks. And it has to do with authorization for the Baltimore plant uh, to increase um, their inventory. So next, as you heard from Commissioner Pichek, Vermont's vaccine rollout has been one of the most successful in the nation. Not only were we the first to reach 90% of our most vulnerable population, those over the age of 65 with at least one dose, but we also ranked second in the nation for vaccine administration. The only state ahead of us, Connecticut, pivoted to our age banning approach after determining their initial strategy was just too complicated. And because demand continues in Vermont, we'll, we've met our May 1st target for the percentage of the adult population vaccinated. We're also averaging our lowest weekly case count since November, which is a good sign that vaccines are working. This, along with our vaccination rates so far, <clears throat> puts us in a strong position to move into step two of the Vermont Forward Plan, which we'll discuss in further detail on Friday. And although cases are at a five-month low and hospitalizations are declining, it's still important to do your part and follow the guidance in place. So don't let your guard down, because we're still working to vaccinate as many Vermonters as possible and we still have much more work to do before we get back to normal. Every day, we're getting closer and closer to a time when you don't need to think about masks, distancing, and crowds with every plan you make or every time you leave home. 
But this all depends on Vermonters continuing to get vaccinated. So again, there are appointments available all over the state. So please, if you don't um, have one already, uh, please sign up. Everyone has a role to play to reach the level of vaccination uh, we need in order to get back to normal. So I'm asking everyone to do your part. We've got a lot to be proud of here in Vermont uh, because uh, from the beginning, we've been a, nas a national leader during the pandemic. So let's make sure that continues and get as many as your, of your friends and family um, vaccinated as soon as possible. Next, as we mentioned on Friday, we publish our guidance for summer camps, both overnight and day camps, which can be found at Vermont Forward uh, on our Vermont Forward webpage. This is uh, important for our summer camps and programs as they plan to ramp up opportunities for Vermont's kids to reconnect this summer. The guidance from both, uh, for both overnight and day programs uh, follows our Vermont Forward framework. As we continue to see reductions in cases and demand for vaccines, I'm confident our kids will have an enjoyable summer. Finally, on Friday, Dr. Levine and I mentioned that Saturday, last Saturday, was National Drug Take Back Day. As we said, during last fall's Take Back uh, Day, the state collected about 4,500 pounds in unused medication. This past weekend, it was over 7,000 pounds. So I want to thank uh, Vermonters for stepping up. And remember, you don't have to wait for these special days. Uh, you can do this year round and you can learn more about this at healthvermont.gov slash do your part. So with that, we'll go back to questions. We'll go right back to uh, Thanks, Governor. So as, as we heard from um, Commissioner Harrington, uh, the state's going to be implementing the uh, work search requirement in, in May. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, with some schools still hybrid and some, some still fully remote, I guess, you know, how, how do we balance the need for, for you know, child care and being able to, you know, have, have not all schools are, are still in person, um, so parents might not necessarily get back to work. So I guess I'm just wondering what, what sort of resources are there and how do we balance that? Yeah, you, you know, again, uh, this has been my concern all along, and that's why we didn't uh, put the work search uh, requirement back into place. But as we see um, more and more schools uh, that are going to uh, in-person instruction, uh, as well as more and more people getting vaccinated, our case counts going down, um, there's more opportunities for um, private childcare uh, facilities as well uh, to step up. And, um, and we're uh, also, uh, we talk about our summer camp opportunities, we'll be able to provide uh, those opportunities for kids uh, this summer. So uh, this is the right time. Um, as we've seen, uh, things are getting closer and closer to being back to normal. We're taking a major step on, on Saturday, and we'll take another, uh, hopefully, uh, if the vaccination rates continue, uh, see another major step in June, and then uh, hopefully be back uh, to normal by the 4th of July. So all of this is uh, interconnected, and we just thought it was the right time to do so. Thank you. Steve? Well, I guess the first one is the uh, racing season opens up this weekend uh, at two of the three Vermont tracks. Uh, are you planning on going fast or? Uh, no, I won't be. Uh, I won't be participating this weekend. But I'm still hoping to uh, take in a few races this summer. Uh, I just haven't determined when that will be. Uh, just too much work to do right now. And uh, I guess with the with the job search requirement being uh, put back in place. Do you see that as possibly helping out the hospitality industry, hospitality food industries? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't see this as being some magical formula for uh, solving our workforce uh, shortage. As you might remember, we had this problem pre-pandemic. Uh, so we're going to have this uh, after the pandemic uh, as well. Uh, and there are a lot of, still, a lot of uh, issues with uh, folks going back to work. Um, one of them being, as we mentioned before, uh, childcare. So, um, but I see this as uh, being a, a, a part of uh, the solution. 
and uh, we do have opportunities in Vermont, and uh, we uh, need to get back to normal. And I think uh, this will, again, just assist people in, uh, in getting out there to see what's available, uh, because I think there are a lot of opportunities. But, uh, but I don't think that this is going to make a, a dramatic change in uh, some of the workforce shortages we, uh, we see. Uh, again, uh, we have uh, uh, we recognize this over the last decade, uh, and it's been increasing. We had the lowest unemployment rate in the country uh, pre-pandemic, uh, and this just hasn't gone away. It, it isn't possibly, especially on the food service side, uh, uh, low wages or anything like that that's uh, bringing this uh, situation. Well, I think, yeah. you know, I mean, there's going to be, it's all about supply and demand. And so uh, wages will increase uh, naturally. It's some of what I've been saying again for the last uh, three or four years when we've had debates about minimum wage increases. Um, I think we're going to see a natural occurrence of uh, increase in wages. Uh, it's organic growth. It's just about that basic principle of supply and demand. So we need more people. And uh, I think wages will come up as a result. Thank you. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Good morning. I want to follow up on the work search requirement. Uh, a restaurateur told us yesterday the situation has become catastrophic. That was his word in terms of just not being able, people just aren't applying for work. Uh, McDonald's this morning announced it's hiring about 400 people for its restaurants in Vermont this summer. Is there a, a concern that people won't come back? That people won't return to the workforce. Uh, do you have an, uh, any thoughts about that? Well, you know, we have a natural attrition uh, because of our demographics. We're getting older, people are retiring and just not uh, participating in the workforce because of uh, the age. So this has, again, been something I've uh, talked about over the last four or five years, our demographic challenges, workforce shortages. We need to grow the economy. We need to bring more people into the state. Uh, and this problem, again, existed before the pandemic, and, and over the last year, it hasn't gotten any better. And so uh, we need to uh, continue to, to uh, adopt policies that will bring more people into the state, as well as make Vermont affordable, affordable enough, so that people stay here. So it's all connected, and, uh, and things haven't changed uh, in that respect. What do you attribute the nearly 20,000 um, growth in population uh, in yesterday's census numbers. What, what do you think is driving that? Is that COVID related? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a combination. I think we have, uh, again, uh, we haven't, uh, we've been initiating a lot of different strategies over the last four years to try and bring more people into the state, remote uh, workers, uh, for example. Um, we took a lot of criticism for that, but uh, I think that, that that was a strategy that uh, that was worthwhile. So we did uh, bring more people into the state as a result of that one strategy, uh, trying to make Vermont more affordable, keeping uh, uh, taxes uh, from growing um, and uh, tax and fees from growing, making, again, Vermont more affordable uh, for people to live and stay here. I think that helped. Um, and again, with the pandemic, uh, we've seen where there's been an increase in real estate sales and uh, being the safest, healthiest state in the country has, uh, has brought, uh, you know, more attention to Vermont and, and people are, are trying to balance what their, uh, what their interests are and what attracts them to different locations. And I think, again, uh, Vermont being the safest, healthiest state in the, in the nation uh, has its attributes. So it's a combination of a number of different factors. But it's, again, okay. not enough. I mean, we, we have to put this into context here. I think it was around 2.7% increase. Um, still not, uh, not the highest in the, in the Northeast by any stretch. And, uh, and again, we're, seeing, we're still lagging behind the rest of the country. Uh, they had, I think, across the country, we might have had a 4% growth. So we're still lagging. Uh, finally, quickly, I imagine that the you would have mentioned had the Canada border uh, been, come up in this morning's conference call. It did not. It did not. No, I know that. Uh, okay. Again, this is a part of their negotiations, um, and each each country uh, has its 
his concerns uh, for good reason. So we'll just have to wait and see what they what they decide. Thank you very much. Wilson Ring, the Associated Press. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. I have another follow on uh, on Stuart Spence's question. Did those numbers surprise you uh, when they came out yesterday that uh, the state had increased so much or the population had increased so much? And do you think it could have been a, an increase of about 20,000 over estimates, 17,000 over 2010, that that much of a change could have come about so quickly within the last three or four years? Or has it just been a hidden increase? Um, you know, it did surprise me a bit. I, I wasn't sure what it would be. I'm pleasantly surprised. And, um, but I don't know when that happened and whether we were just expecting worse uh, and then having uh, upwards to 20,000 people uh, increase uh, in population here in the state uh, was, uh, was something that, again, we need. But, but it's still, again, 2.7% just isn't enough. Uh, we need to, uh, to increase that uh, in order to, to work our way through uh, the workforce challenges that we have here and to make Vermont more affordable and grow this economy. Okay, uh, thank you. I have a, a question about vaccine and recording the vaccine. Um, does the state or, I don't know, the health department or whoever, whoever, uh, they record the vaccines that people are getting and, and do they also get the, uh, the, the data from the pharmacies that are giving them so that at some point, if, if someone loses their card, they could find out what they were given and ultimately, they could use those. Uh, it seems the world is trending towards some sort of vaccine passport, and they could use those state records as a way to prove what they got as opposed to just having the, the, the card. The, the short answer is yes. Um, but if you want more detail, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Yeah, there is an immunization registry. So all doses that are administered in the state whether it's by the pharmacy or whether it's by one of our own clinics that we run, uh, end up being recorded in the registry. Uh, sometimes there's a lag period uh, for some of the pharmacies to get that information there, but they've been much better at getting that there in a timely way. Um, there are some uh, rules and regulations regarding how that registry can be used in terms of the data, so I wouldn't want to promise we would be using the registry uh, as a quick go-to place for uh, verifying if somebody had a vaccine or not, because that would not be what its intended use is for, and it would probably go against a regulation. However, the issue of passports in general, as you know, is one that is only at the debate stage nationwide um, and even internationally. Uh, so. Uh, it's, We'll have to see how that plays out. I would just ask all Vermonters to hold on to that card that they do have at the time they get vaccinated, uh, because that's very important. <clears throat> and I know a lot of people are taking pictures of that as well and putting it on their uh, smartphones, which is a great idea. Okay, and do people now have, are people who get the receipt, the vaccines, are they able to check their, uh, their registration? on the, your website? Uh, no, that's not something they can, um, they can't access the immunization registry to look at their own um, data on there, no. Is that coming? Um, I don't think we've had that discussion. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Those are my questions. Cameron Paquette, St. Albans Messenger. Hi, yes. Um, we have a company up here in Franklin County, and we're, they have a number of jobs to fill, and word is, you know, if they don't fill those jobs in time, they would consider um, leaving their footprint up there. And um, I'm wondering, you know, leading up to this decision, were there any other companies in the state that expressed this concern, and did that play a role? Um, this has been a concern of many uh, different entities over the last uh, few weeks, um, and I, I'm not. It didn't play a role in our decision. Uh, in a lot of respects, 
we've been waiting for the right time uh, as well. You know, the vaccination rates uh, made a difference as well as uh, trying to, uh, to have schools go into more in-person learning. Uh, and uh, all that coupled together with our case rates uh, decreasing led us uh, to believe this was the right time uh, to reinstitute, reinstitute the work search requirement. But this isn't, you know, this isn't something magical that's automatically going to uh, have people return to work. Um, we still, they still need to have some of those uh, um, necessities like childcare, uh, for instance, and. Uh, and, and there, you know, to be perfectly blunt, there are some uh, who uh, are perfectly content uh, staying uh, on the um, uh, unemployment assistance uh, because of the $300 stipend. And um, following on that, um, looking at the labor shortage, I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into that, what it specifically looks like. Is it... Um, the jobs that need to be filled, are they primarily in person? Are they a certain sector or other? And uh, has sort of the migration toward um, or the use, more use of uh, remote positions had any sort of impact on these as well? Uh, again, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, I can go back just two years ago and point to the fact that we had we had the lowest unemployment uh, rate in the country, 2.2%, as I remember. Uh, we had more jobs available than we had people to fill them at that point in time, two years ago. Uh, so this problem hasn't fixed itself. Um, and I want to stress that, that we still need to put measures in place. We need to focus on the future in order to work our way out of the position we find ourselves in. We didn't get into this overnight. We're not getting out of it overnight either. Um, but that's why it's so important that we take, for instance, uh, the uh, federal aid that we receive, that's $2.7 billion. A billion of that is uh, flexible. The $1.7 billion goes direct to programs and so forth to help people. It's $1.1 billion, it's a little more flexible. Uh, that's what uh, I presented to the legislature uh, to invest in things we need for the future that we haven't been able to afford. Like, um, having $250 million uh, for housing. Uh, that's, that's important. If we want to bring more people in, affordable housing is going to be important. Uh, if we want to have broadband, which has precluded some people from, from coming and living in Vermont, there's another $250 million that we presented uh, to the legislature. Climate change mitigation is something that that is uh, of interest to many and is part of our future uh, to make sure that we're, we're safe and we're paying attention, we're doing our part uh, to prevent uh, some of the uh, catastrophic events in the future. Uh, there's 200 million there. And, and water, sewer, and stormwater are all critical pieces of the infrastructure that we need in order to bring more people into the state. Uh, that coupled with uh, about a, a 170 million for economic development, um, if we were to take that money, this one-time money, it's not, it's not ongoing, just one-time money to invest in something monumental for the future, uh, we could change the trajectory of Vermont. But if we squander this opportunity, if we waste this opportunity, uh, and then we look back uh, in five or 10 years and, and wonder what we did with our billion dollars, um, it will be it, it will just be uh, regrettable in so many different ways. So that's why I'm stressing uh, that if we want to do things different in Vermont, we want a different uh, trajectory, a different path forward, then we better invest in, uh, with the, the money we have wisely. Uh, all right, thank you. Greg Lamro, the county courier. Good afternoon. I'm going to pick up where Cameron left off there. As you know, we've asked you several times about uh, the unemployment issues in, in Vermont and, and particularly in Franklin County. And uh, I, I can assume that Cameron was talking about uh, KTEC in, in Richford, um, who told us last week that uh, they, they may be facing irreparable damage because the work search has gone on. The work search requirement has has not been there for so long. I'm, I'm wondering um, what your plan is long term to help businesses that have 
that have faced long-term damage by this policy to not require workers to at yeah. least. I think you're, you're, you're leading us, Greg, you're just leading us in the wrong direction here. I mean, you're just assuming uh, that the reason that we have a workforce shortage is because we didn't have the, uh, the um, requirement, the work search requirement, which I, I just, uh, I just don't agree with. I just don't believe that's the case. Uh, we could have put the work search uh, requirement in place uh, from the beginning, and uh, we'd be in the same situation today that we find ourselves in. I mean, child care is a is a big deal uh, to some. I think you probably some of the employees uh, from that organization uh, need child care as well. Uh, and I think that uh, as you know, some of the circumstances involving unemployment at this point in time made it lucrative for some people to stay uh, on the uh, on, on the work unemployment uh, system. So I uh, I just disagree uh, with the premise that uh, the work uh, search requirement is going to be the magic bullet uh, that will solve this problem because again I can't stress enough we had this problem before and if and I'm sure you were reporting on this a year or two ago when we had more jobs than we had people to fill them. And this is the, the same situation we find ourselves in today, only we have about 30,000 people on UI right now. And awaiting, awaiting our way through this uh, pandemic uh, has led us to some people just can't get back to work. They have kids they have to take care of. And they, have no, they haven't been able to put them uh, they're not in school uh, because of remote learning. So it's all coupled together and, uh, and put us in an extremely vulnerable position. Uh, but uh, in terms of helping some of those, those entities, we have in part of my, and I'm sure you've reported this as well, the five buckets in the ARPA proposal that I put forward to the legislature, 170 million of that is for economic relief. And uh, for those who haven't been able to to take advantage of some of the uh, PPP money and grants and loans uh, uh, from uh, previous uh, CARES Act dollars. But we have more dollars that we need to help some of these businesses uh, survive. So we'll continue to do that. But the answer after all is said and done is uh, a continuing to try to make Vermont more affordable, trying to attract more people here. Um, that's why I asked for, um, in, in, in a lot of respects, not only uh, from um, uh, common decency standpoint, uh, but from an economic standpoint, asking uh, the federal government to increase our refugee program, a uh, tripling our refugee program. So uh, there, there are a number of strategies that we need to implement in order to bring more people in the state, uh, to the state, um, because we don't, we simply, because of our demographics, we simply don't have enough people right now uh, to satisfy uh, some of the workforce uh, requirements that we have. So, so again, we'll be there. I mean, it's uh, it's a lot of it's dependent on the legislature in terms of what they do with some of the proposal that we put forth uh, to invest the billion dollars for the future. Uh, but uh, stay tuned on that. Well, you, you've been governor now for you're in your fifth year. So I'm I'm wondering how you're going to work with the legislature to ensure that this actually happens. It's easy to to, to post blame and say, hey. You know the legislature isn't making these uh, these rules and and policies to get to my desk, but you're in your fifth year as governor. I'm I'm wondering what's your plan to make sure that it actually happens this year, next year. Same same strategy we've been using for the last four years. I think we've been successful in a lot of regards, Greg. So I don't know what uh, what you would say I should do. I've vetoed uh, budget bills. I've worked with them in a different number of different ways. Um, we've gotten some things accomplished. A lot of things have fallen by the wayside. Uh, but, uh, but in this situation, I think we're at a pivotal time. Um, a billion dollars has just fallen from the sky in some respects. It's here, right in front of us. We can invest it uh, wisely. We can't use it to fill uh, budget gaps. We can't use it uh, to, uh, to um, prop up different programs. We have to invest it in areas that will give us the, the best return on investment that we could possibly have. So um, we'll continue to, to uh, make the case uh, for why this is an important time and why we need to help continue to help businesses. As you've seen over the last year, 
uh, we have consistently uh, gone into the legislature asking for relief for businesses uh, so that we can have the jobs available when we're out of the, the pandemic. I, I just don't know where you would think that we haven't been doing that. Okay. And uh, lastly, Governor, I, I understand that there's been a policy change from VSP uh, not to release the names of any minors regardless of their involvement either in a crime or in their involvement in an incident which which regards a crime. I believe this came up over the weekend with a, a fatality in the southern part of the state. And for decades, minors have shared the roadways with the rest of society with the understanding that they'd be held to the same standard. And, and now it, it appears that we're making kind of a two-tiered program here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if it's your intention that um, those who get behind the wheel, if they're under 18, are not held to the same standard as as an adult. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this just happened over the weekend. As you might remember, we, uh, we had this challenge over the last year or so, uh, based on another incident. It forced us to reflect on that and look at the statute. Uh, the law says that we can't. We don't believe we can. Um, we want to provide more transparency, but we're going to have to have. Uh, some help from the legislature. I know you don't want to hear that, Greg, but I'm going to need some help from the legislature in order to change the law. Uh, in in the meantime, we have to follow the law. So, so would you resist additional laws to expand uh, the, the clouding of names when it comes to minors? Is that my understanding? Yeah, we were. I was fine with what we were doing before, uh, but then we found that we were counter to statute so we had to follow the law uh, so i'm f fine with going back to what we had before but we're going to need some help from the legislature in order to do that okay thank you Pepper, and hopefully somebody else can pick up where i left off on that have a great day i don't know what more i can say on that greg michael vermont digger Michael Digger. All right, we'll move to Ann Wallace Allen, seven days. Hi, um, I have another question about reinstating the work search requirement, and that is how is this going to work for people on PUA? Commissioner Harrington, you mentioned that, and I'm just wondering if you can just lay out some of the basics for people who are. I'm sure they will tune in later to get the details, but um, how can they prove that they are looking for work if they are self-employed and, uh, and those other areas that you guys haven't really worked with until the, the pandemic? Thanks, Ann. I, I would just clarify um, my comments specifically indicated that if someone is self-employed, an independent contractor or a sole proprietor, that they do not have to look for work. So there are individuals who did qualify for PUA because they did not qualify under the standard provisions of regular unemployment. Uh, and those are the individuals um, who uh, are not established as a self-employed individual or an independent contractor that will need to uh, look for work. However, um, I, I don't think it's far-fetched uh, to assume that the federal government at some point uh, may require individuals who are independent contractors, sole proprietors, and self-employed to be engaged in business uh, recruitment efforts. Um, so uh, if they are, if they do fall into one of those buckets, are they out there um, looking to either reopen their business or secure additional, um, you know, jobs or, or other forms of, of income? Um, so I, we also put that in there as a caveat, um, just as kind of a, a forewarning that there may be a time when the federal government does require um, those individuals to to prove that they are out there and actively looking um, to uh, to open back up. But right now, um, this applies to individuals who are not self-employed and not independent contractors. So, um, can you estimate how many people this applies to then in the state? I think you guys have about 30,000 people collecting unemployment. Is that right? Uh, I can't give you an estimate just because I haven't uh, pulled the, the numbers from the system, but there are roughly 
somewhere between 20 and 22,000 individuals that are collecting some form of regular unemployment uh, insurance and roughly uh, 10,000 individuals uh, collecting under the PUA program. I just, in the PUA program, I, I don't have the breakdown of uh, who's an independent contractor or self-employed versus, um, you know, that whether they fall under a, a different designation. So that, so it sounds like um, between 20 and 22,000 people will start, will need to start um, showing that they are looking for work and making contact with prospective employers? Uh, not necessarily. Um, also in my comments, I uh, indicated that if they have a COVID qualifying circumstance, uh, so again, um, the legislature back at the early part of the pandemic passed expanded eligibility for unemployment, uh, COVID qualifying reasons, if you will. Uh, and if an individual still meets one of those COVID qualifying reasons um, for not uh, returning to work, uh, then they would not be required to conduct a work search. Um, so again, there will be a, a, a portion of that population who may, um, may fall into one of those uh, eligibility um, criteria, um, but again, that, that remains to be seen at this point because we haven't necessarily asked um, the specific question uh, as it pertains to the work search. Does COVID qualifying mean they have somebody at home who um, needs to be taken care of? Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple of them. And, and I should also just remind folks, we will have a media availability uh, tomorrow afternoon um, so we can answer um, more immediate questions or, or detailed questions. But um, for instance, if someone is um, needing to remain home to care for a loved one um, who is suffering from COVID-19 or, or a subsequent issue related to COVID-19 or is quarantining um, because they have a significant health condition um, that prevents them um, from, uh, from returning um, to normal life. If they are caring for a child who has either um, lost their childcare or is um, doing remote learning, or if the individual themselves has been instructed by uh, a specialist or a healthcare provider to either quarantine because they um, were exposed to COVID-19, they contracted COVID-19, uh, or if they have a health condition um, that prevents them from re uh, returning uh, to the work site at this time. Although, uh, you know, I think, again, um, there will be more detailed conversations uh, around what, what long-term um, looks like uh, in those cases, and, and I expect more, more guidance from the federal government as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, I guess I'll take up Greg's invitation to follow up uh, on his last question. It's kind of ironic because I was going to ask you last Friday about an update on the gag order that Public Safety Commissioner Sherling implemented. It was last September where a wrong way driver killed two people in a head-on crash in Charlotte. <clears throat> but over the weekend there, Vermont had another case of another 16-year-old driver reportedly killing her classmate, and the teen driver was driving drunk, the police say. So now Commissioner Sterling has further stretched his gag order to mandate the state police hide the name even of young people killed in car crashes, not just the drivers, but people who are killed in crashes. So even though the obituary is going to be in the paper probably uh, tomorrow and the death certificate's public and the school principal is talking about the victim and the friends have painted the name on the road at the crash site, uh, the state police are being directed, you know, that they can't give out the name of person whose name is actually going to be in the accident report. That gag order, by the way, was billed as being brief, and now we're seven months in and counting. So I'm just wondering, uh, the Vermont Attorney General sided with transparency at the time. Their own legal counsel testified in the legislature that the public had a right to know the truth. Yet Commissioner Sterling seems to be at odds with your transparency stance that you had as a senator, lieutenant governor, and governor. I'm just wondering, uh, at what point does it, everybody get on the same page here and 
we're going to have transparency in Vermont. Yeah, uh, Mike, as you as you are well aware, uh, the reason our general counsel was in testifying with the legislature about our position was because we need a we feel we need a change in the statute uh, to allow us to continue to do what we were doing before. So until that happens, we feel as though we have to follow the law. And from our standpoint, this means not giving out that information. We do, uh, I would rather go back uh, to where we were um, before this situation um, arose and uh, go back to that transparency. But, and I thought we were on our way to doing so, but, uh, but I'm not sure what the legislature is doing at this point, whether they're going to move forward with this or not. It may be a better question for them, actually. Well, it's, they've got a bill, and I mean they're they're moving to, uh, uh, and it was little input from law enforcement on this whole thing, from what we were told that uh, they they're now looking at uh, allowing people uh, up to I think it's age twenty two to, you know, be able to go to juvenile court or be a youthful offender uh, up to age twenty two and. Uh, I think what Greg was getting at about shouldn't everybody have the same consequences, I guess, on the on the highway. But uh, I mean, should uh, should teenagers, uh, you know, face charges of driving while intoxicated with death resulting, or careless and negligent driving with death resulting, in adult court instead of putting them in a juvenile court where you know, we've discussed this in the past, that there are no real consequences. There's no juvenile jail anymore. The best they can do is tell you to get some counseling probably and maybe do community service or something like that. But, I mean, should the so-called Big 12 crime, should DWI with death resulting be included in that now? Uh, again, we uh, testified on this. Uh, our general counsel testified on this. and. We thought we were coming to a place where we could all agree. I think you had even said that you could, uh, I don't know if it was reluctantly or not, but uh, agree to the position we were heading towards. And uh, then it stalled for whatever reason. I'm just not sure. Um, but, uh, but I thought we were getting to a, to a point where uh, we could come to some resolution. Yeah, and I think the House Committee government office is considering uh, this for the final time this afternoon. So we'll, we'll see if this fatal crash causes them to put the brakes on a little bit. Uh, but yeah, well, we, anyway. ho we hope so. Okay. We'd like to come to some resolution as well. Would you consider vetoing it if you think it was too uh, wide open? Um, possibly. I mean, I, I would take that into consideration. Um, I don't know what the final bill is going to cover, um, but I have, you know, I have some concerns about a, a number of pieces of legislation moving through the legislature at this point in time. So, I would not rule out uh, veto on on a number of issues. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Yep. Cat WCAX. Hi, so I'm seeing in the New York Times just a moment ago, the CDC updated its guidance on masks for vaccinated people outdoors. Um, so when they're exercising alone or with family members or when they attend small gatherings, the CDC says they don't need to wear them anymore. However, the CDC did stop short of um, stopping masking outside altogether. Obviously this just came in, but Dr. Levine, do you have any initial thoughts on hearing that and how it compares to Vermont's guidance? Well, again, we've been talking about this for a while, Kat, and uh, the last couple of weeks, and then we heard that the CDC was going to come out with their own guidance, and we wanted to wait and see what they came up with um, before we move forward. So we will reflect on that, uh, take that into consideration as we develop our own uh, policy uh, for in the next uh, week or so. So I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer the rest of that. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Um, basically, I think the CDC is uh, practicing what I'm terming um, pragmatic 
applied public health, trying to make sure that what they tell citizens is important, uh, is truly important and science and data driven uh, so that people won't sort of look at something and go, well, that's ridiculous and not pay attention to the things you really want them to pay attention to. So I think they've begun to uh, recognize um, that perhaps there's an opportunity in the outdoor setting to not wear a mask and not expect you're going to transmit virus. Um, there's some very new uh, reviews out on this uh, in the scientific literature, um, and I mean very new, so we have to uh, analyze that ourselves here as well, um, as well as some older data going way back to Wuhan, China from the very beginning uh, that would support such a stance. Though I have to say there's a lot of um, literature that's not adequate to support it either. Just for, for monitors to understand what we're going to be thinking about, there's basically three things you need to consider. Number one, is the person indoors, where the risk is admittedly very high, or outdoors, and especially high if you're indoors in a crowded setting? Number two, uh, is there an opportunity to separate people and not be on top of each other? So the physically distancing aspect. And then number three, what will a mask do uh, in, in those settings? And really, uh, most of us are agreeing now that two out of three of those have to be in favor of um, non-spread of virus before you would begin to uh, say, no, don't wear a mask. So what the CDC is saying today is if you're outdoors and you're not on top of each other, but you're uh, able to distance, um, perhaps a mask would not be advisable not, or not be necessary. And as the governor was saying, I think we've kind of been saying that since the beginning. Uh, even in the outdoor setting, we've not tell, told people to take away their masks, but we've always said um, that you know there are times in the outdoor setting that you can take your mask off because you're very distant from anybody and you're out doing something on your own, uh, alone, uh, in the woods or on a bike path or what have you. Uh, so again, uh, just those three criteria and trying to put them all together in a way that makes sense. Well, I've got you here. There was another New York Times article recently that talked about how some people who are immunocompromised might not be as protected by the COVID vaccine as we would like them to be. So what's the guidance for Vermonters about that, both for those who are immunocompromised themselves, but also for those who have friends or loved ones who are? Should they be taking extra precautions despite being fully vaccinated? And if so, when might they be able to say, okay, I think it's about safe to not take those? Yeah, so these are really good questions and important for that subset of the population you just described. Um, because one never knows uh, depending on what kind of immune compromising condition one has or what medications you're taking that could uh, hinder your immune system's ability to mount a full response to a vaccine. So you never know exactly how much immunity that group of people is going to have, though nobody would say they shouldn't get vaccinated. Everyone agrees they should get vaccinated. Even in some of the current guidance from, uh, from us as well as from CDC, uh, we talk about uh, the vaccinated person still being aware of who is in their surroundings. So that, yes, one vaccinated family and another vaccinated family may feel comfortable sitting around a table without masks and eating their dinner together. But if one of the members of that vaccinated family is actually an immunocompromised person, you're supposed to factor that in in your decision making. And certainly now, even though we've provided you with very optimistic information about the path of the virus in Vermont now and how good a job everyone is doing in Vermont, the reality is uh, there's still plenty of virus around and people need to be cognizant of the person they're with. And if that person does have an immune uh, issue, then uh, we should be respectfully masking in the presence of that person, even if we think we have very low likelihood of transmitting virus because we're vaccinated. And that kind of thought process is going to have to continue for a number more months. So uh, that's my answer to your question. Great. Thank you very much. 
Devin Bates, local 22, local 44. Yeah, question for Governor Scott. You had mentioned at Friday's briefing that you told the second gentleman Vermont needs more vaccine. And I'm seeing now um, experts are concerned that the U.S. will start to run out of people willing to be vaccinated within a matter of weeks. And you've spoken, um, you know, to the sense that that's not the case in Vermont. But as the incentive maybe starts to go away as things reopen anyway, is there concern that you know, we're working with a short timeline here to get a greater supply. Um, could it be something that's too little too late if that doesn't arrive soon? Well, again, uh, that is exactly why we want to make sure that we're getting the supply we need to vaccinate those who, who uh, want it and that we continue uh, to provide uh, for uh, that to happen. So we have to do our part. We have to make sure that we get the supply in. The federal government has to make sure that we get a supply and not uh, reduce uh, anything from the state. Uh, and uh, thus far, it appears we've been successful. I had some conversations with the, um, some of the pharmacies last week, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and they agreed uh, to work with us uh, in order to use up some of their allotment uh, to provide for more pop-up clinics and so forth and working together uh, in any way we can. So I think uh, we're in fairly good shape here in Vermont at this point, but uh, but yes, I mean, we've seen other states around the country that uh, have um, ha have just turned down uh, their supply. They don't need it uh, this week because they have so much in inventory, uh, but that's not the case here in Vermont. Uh, and we still have uh, one category to go, uh, those, uh, uh, who are uh, college students that uh, aren't intending to stay here this summer. We'd like to get uh, at least one uh, one of the uh, doses into them, uh, if not uh, the the Johnson Johnson, but the, the two dose, at least one out of the two, uh, and to those second homeowners uh, coming back uh, to Vermont after wintering somewhere else, we'd like to provide for their needs as well. So um, that'll happen, I think, on Thursday, and uh, we'll continue to do our part and, and asking you all to do your part as well in trying to uh, to get more people to get their vaccinations because that's part of our strategy uh, and it's part of our path back to normal. All right, thank you. And then a question for Dr. Levine. Uh, you had mentioned at the top of the briefing that there were um, 3% of Vermonters who hadn't gone back for their second dose um, and you mentioned that's a lot lower than what we're seeing nationally, but what can be done in that situation? Um, you had mentioned that there's some work to try to maybe get those people back in. What does that process look like? And you know, why, why do you think this is happening, I guess? Does the Department of Health have any idea why someone you know, would go through the process of getting their first dose and then suddenly kind of drop off the map like that? Yeah, I'm not aware that we have a whole list of reasons behind that. Um, some of them may have to do with uh, forgetfulness or just inconvenience, and that one we can easily remedy and will be. Um, another reason could be uh, illness in a person uh, in between the two doses, so them waiting a longer period of time before they get their second dose. Um, on rare occasions, I suppose the person might not be alive. Um, but that should be a very small percentage of these 3%. But again, the 3% is a very small number here. Um, I, I, it's, I, I do know from reading national news, this is not Vermont news, but Vermonters probably would fall in line with this. There are some who uh, got side effects after their first shot and would be reluctant to come back for a second shot. Um, we have to be aware of that. But there are strategies that can work with that population as well. Um, and so, again, once we have an awareness, I think we can pretty much respond to whatever the concern is. That's my short list of kinds of reasons that I can come up with. Um, we haven't spent a tremendous amount of time on you know, th this second effort part yet, because uh, our major effort is getting as many Vermonters vaccinated as possible, knowing that even these 3% are protected to some degree. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, but certainly, um, we want to hear from them and we can work with them. Thank you. 
Tadley, the Valley Reporter. Hi, Governor. I have two questions for you today. First, if you lose your COVID vaccination card, what's the process involved in replacing it? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Um, I think, I, I believe you can call the Department of Health and they could assist in that way, but I'll let Dr. Levine answer. I mean, we'll still have a record that you got vaccinated um, and you'll be in our system. So we can, we can attend to that need. All right, thanks. And um, my second question is about your new summer camp guidance, which says that campers don't actually need to wear masks while they're eating and sleeping. And so I'm wondering how can camps approach these exceptions to mask wearing safely? Dr. Levine. So some of the strategies, for instance, with sleeping are distance, and um, head to toe so that not everybody is lined up in the same direction. Keep in mind that at the arrival at the camp, people are getting tested and so they know their status at that point in time. I know there's uh, opportunities to leave camp, so to speak, and go on field trips or whatever, but I do believe most of the camps are not going to be having people traveling outside of the camp setting. So obviously that will help in terms of not making sure that uh, any virus is present. And then we'll be in a different place at that time as well. So um, not, as you saw in the modeling projections, which you could model yourself seeing the trend that we're going in, uh, we're ending up at a point in time in the summertime when we hope there should be markedly less virus uh, than now, uh, less transmissibility between people occurring, especially if the vaccination uh, progress that every Vermonter has been making has held up during that time. Uh, during eating, that's a different story. Um, you know, one, one, one thing the schools use is uh, everybody facing in the same direction. Um, some camps would be able to do that. But another thing that I think can happen very commonly in camp is not eating indoors. Or if you're eating indoors, eating in a very large uh, room that has uh, a lot of air circulating and uh, is essentially contiguous with the outdoors so that there won't be that big a difference. So there are gonna be a lot, a lot of strategies that can be utilized in that, uh, for that concern. Okay, thank you. And just as a follow-up about those modeling projections, when do you expect that masking and social distancing guidelines will disappear? Like, will we still be masked in public after July 4th? Okay, so when you look closely at the Vermont Forward Plan, which I urge everyone to, um, during the next uh, two months, May and June, uh, we have what's called universal guidance which includes the masking as it is being done currently. Beginning uh, with the July 4th, it now turns to as a recommended strategy as opposed to a required strategy. And what that means is just what it means, but uh, we still think that that will be a very important factor. Obviously, we look at data every week and every month, and as we progress through these next several months and get towards the summer, um, we will obviously be updating uh, our guidance and our recommendations to people. But the, the Vermont Forward Plan already incorporates a transition from the requirement to the recommendation. All right, thank you so much. It's a good opportunity as well with your vaccination cards to remind everyone once you get vaccinated, you get your card. Uh, take a photo of it and keep it uh, there on your phone or take a copy and put it someplace safe. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, 
lot of discussion on workforce shortage issues uh, so far today. I'm, I'm wondering if you think supporting the state college system fits into that picture as a means of mitigating the state's brain drain and attracting uh, young people from out of state to hopefully come here and learn and then work. Yeah, there's no one strategy. Uh, it's all the above. And uh, certainly the colleges, 90% uh, of those in the state college system are from Vermont. Um, so that's a way to keep, hopefully, and keep our, um, some of our youth here. Um, I know that <coughs> uh, UVM and uh, other uh, Norwich and Middlebury and so forth uh, have all uh, led to people making Vermont their homes afterwards. So I think higher ed in general is a, uh, is a good tool uh, to use because once they come here, get acclimated to Vermont, uh, find uh, ways to appreciate Vermont, and then find opportunity. Uh, and that's the key. You know, when, when we asked people, it wasn't lost on us you know, over the last four or five years uh, as to uh, a tremendous resource we had with, with our college system, universities, and so forth, uh, that we had, I think it was 10,000 uh, kids graduating every single year uh, throughout the whole system. And we just needed to find a way to keep some of them here. And when we asked them, first of all, it was opportunity, uh, you know, a, a, a good uh, paying career, a good job, uh, something uh, that would keep them here, uh, but as well, uh, decent affordable housing. And uh, that was uh, key. That was almost on everyone's list, was finding that decent affordable housing. And that's why, you know, we did the bond uh, early on, two or three years ago. Uh, $37 million bond, uh, leveraged about $65 million in private assets, made it the single largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen. Uh, and now today, again, as I remarked earlier, uh, my hope is that we would take a portion of this one-time money that we're receiving for recovery from the federal government and take $250 million. That's two and a half times what, what we said was the, the largest investment in housing we'd ever seen two years ago investment in housing, uh, both for those with uh, very low incomes as well as those in the in the workforce, and uh, to free up some of uh, the other uh, uh, housing stock as well. So we have a lot of initiatives uh, that we'd like to put forward. We've been putting forward. Some of it was in our budget in January, uh, but with this new newfound money, um, it will give us an opportunity to to keep more people here, attract more people as well. But this, the, the college system, higher education is key, um, I think, from all standpoints, a, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, does your plan uh, uh, on that one-time money uh, direct any of it towards the colleges? No, I, I don't. We did not um, because we have a, as well, just to remind everyone, um, we had a, Back in January, uh, we had a $200 million surplus, um, and uh, so there was one-time money there, and we had provided uh, for uh, the colleges within that uh, bucket of money, uh, as well it's grown since then. Since January, uh, we now find ourselves with about a, another $100 million, so now we have $300 million of surplus one-time money. Uh, so th we think uh, there's enough money there uh, to invest in the state college system with the one-time money out of the uh, general fund, not out of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with this uh, one-time money from, uh, from Congress. Okay, thank you very much. John Dillon, DPR. Thank you. Uh, I had a question, I think, for Mike Harrington and then for Dr. Uh, Michael Harrington and then for Dr. Levine. Um, we've heard a lot there about the uh, worker shortage, and I, I know that Global Foundries up in Chittenden County is, is desperate for um, to expand its workforce and has offered a signing bonus. Is there an estimate of how many jobs are available? There's 30,000 people on unemployment, but what about the, the number of jobs out there? And uh, I know the state works to match the two, but um, are we increasing those efforts? Thank you, um, Governor. I just wanted to offer you an opportunity to comment first, if you wanted to. Yeah. No. I mean, we we've, we've talked about this a lot. We had um, yep. we had more jobs than we had people, um, you know, pre-pandemic. So 
Uh, I, I expect it's the same now, uh, but I don't know uh, how many jobs are available at this point. And maybe, Mike, uh, you have the data to support that. If you don't, we can certainly uh, get that together because I think it's important uh, to understand what, uh, what the need is. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, the, so we don't have um, a, a clear method for obviously capturing all the available jobs that are in the market right now. We have different methods, um, whether it be through the state's uh, job board system, and they're typically around 6,000 jobs posted on the state's job board system. Uh, we also know that that doesn't capture everything that's out there either that is posted through other online mechanisms uh, or in newspapers or, or simply word of mouth. Um, so we, we recognize that's only a fraction. Um, I think, you know, I will say that in one of uh, our proposals um, to, uh, in our recovery plan that went to the legislature did, um, was seeking funding uh, for doing a market analysis and an employer job needs assessment. Um, however, that, uh, that funding did not make it through um, review by the legislature and was, was taken out of the budget. So, um, you know, it, it is not like there is one method out there, one stop where you can grab this data because there are so many different ways for people to post um, uh, information. But we would encourage employers um, who are looking for work to engage with our work, uh, workers, uh, to engage with our workforce development team uh, and get their positions posted uh, in our um, the Vermont job link uh, so that we can have a good understanding of what the landscape looks like. John, if I could add as well, I mean, just talking with some of uh, my friends who are still in business, um, they are have the jobs available uh, waiting for their employees to come back. Uh, so. It's not as though they're seeking out seeking or, or putting ads out for those positions. Uh, they, they are just waiting for the employees to return to work. Thank you. Um, and for Dr. Levine, this study, I think the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine is being studied now for uh, people 13 to 15 years of age. Um, assuming that's approved, would you consider the COVID shot to be mandatory or would the state consider it to be mandatory for high school students in the fall? Colleges are doing it now. So just to correct you, it's age 12 to 15. Um, okay. Thanks. But that's okay. So it's mostly middle school and it would um, probably become active late in May at the earliest. Um, but. Uh, there have been no discussions regarding uh, mandating this vaccine at this point in time. Um, hasn't hasn't been an issue that we've discussed. Is that because you think it wouldn't be needed that people would sign up, or because you don't want to make another mandate? Or no, I do think I do think that, that there's I, I do think that there's a possibility that there will be. Uh, a large number that will sign up for sure, um, especially uh, with the assistance of our pediatric community uh, who are very committed to uh, their patients and uh, informing them about all of the benefits of getting vaccine. So, um, you know, mandating has not come up at any point in this discussion, you know, from the moment we started with offering vaccine to long-term care facility residents and to healthcare workers uh, on through. Uh, so that, that's just not been part of our discussion. And I think our results are actually superb at this point in time. You've seen the data that we presented each, each step of the way. Uh, so that I think without mandating, uh, we're making a lot of progress. And um, we shouldn't start thinking about those kinds of concepts uh, and, uh, at, a, at a time when we're leading the country in success. And there are states that actually are far less successful that have not done so either. I don't know if the governor Thank you. wants to say anything. Avery Powell, WCAX. 
My first question is for Commissioner Harrington. We received a tip that there are some technical difficulties going on on the Department of Labor website that claimants are unable to open a new benefit year. Are you all experiencing any issues right now? I'm happy to take that back and, and ask the team. That's not my experience and I haven't been notified of that as of yet today. So happy to review back. There are processes in place that prevent someone from opening a new benefit year prior to the benefit year that they're in expiring. So even if they try to go in uh, a day or even a few hours ahead of time um, before the benefit year has expired, it won't let them file a new benefit year. There are also other provisions in place too. Um, so again, I, I would want to do some digging to find out whether it truly is a technical issue or just the, the way someone is, is filing, but I'm happy to bring that back to the team and, and make sure there's no issue that's preventing people from filing. Okay, thank you. And uh, Governor Scott, as I'm sure you've, you've seen, Coffee Cup Bakery has closed permanently. Any thoughts on this Vermont brand shutting down? Yeah, very unfortunate. Um, I knew that there was some financial issues over the last uh, year or so, but, um, but it took me by surprise that they shut down so quickly yesterday. So um, again, it's a, a bit of an iconic brand for us here in Vermont. I'm hopeful that maybe someone else uh, could make a, a, a viable concern out of it. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but, um, but in the meantime, uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting all the employees. Uh, as we've heard a lot, uh, that there are many uh, different uh, job openings uh, throughout the state. Uh, so we'll do our best to connect them, those employees, with some uh, viable alternatives. Thank you. Aaron Tanko, Vermont Digger. Hello. I know the workforce for a long period of time, you know, especially to, you know, do child care needs will be disadvantaged in returning to work. And the department has imposed implementing a dependency benefit being discussed in the legislature. Are you targeting any programs at that population to help them out with this uh, job search? Aaron, we missed the very beginning of the question, if you wouldn't mind starting from the top. Yeah, um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, mothers and, and parents who have been out of the workforce for a really long time to care for kids, they're going to be kind of disadvantaged when they go back to work. Um, so I'd kind of like to know how the state plans to help them. Maybe you could just um, describe disadvantage in what way, Aaron? Oh, uh, you know, in finding in finding a position, because as Carrington said, people who have been out of the workforce for a long time may have a tougher time finding a job. Um, we will assist them in any way we can, but maybe Commissioner Harrington would have some further thoughts on that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Governor. There were a couple different um, comments there that I just want to make sure um, I, I hit on. So obviously, um, there are a number of different opportunities. Just the, the fact of having someone looking for work um, and seeking job opportunities is the first step. However, um, you know, we do have a workforce development division. Uh, prior to COVID-19, it was our largest division um, and, uh, and has a number of different programs um, for, for pretty much any population in terms of either um, upskilling, uh, providing additional training opportunities, um, whether it's on the job training, apprenticeships, and so on, um, or even just working with them to help link individuals uh, with businesses and, and find open positions. So, um, you know, from that perspective, uh, uh, I, there are, are plenty of opportunities out there for individuals to um, find additional support services. Um, you did make a comment um, about the dependency benefit. And I just want to clarify um, just real quickly on that, that the department's position, um, while it has been against the dependency benefit, um, it has clearly stated that it's not the dependency benefit that we are necessarily against. It's the fact that um, we currently don't have the system in place, the capacity um, or the mechanisms in place to um, create a brand new benefit and administer it and think we would do it um, successfully and in, in complete compliance 
um, with what would need to be in place, mainly because of our staffing limitations, but but more significantly our system limitations. So um, we have testified and, and said we are happy to have that conversation uh, at a later date. Um, the best time would be maybe at a point once we've modernized our system and can look at um, changes to uh, a variety of different um, provisions uh, in the system. Um, but again, the, the specificity there is more around our ability to actually um, implement a new benefit and effectively administer a new benefit. Um, but to your point, um, I think every there are there are large groupings of populations that have now been receiving benefits for for more than a year, um, going on 13 and and in some cases maybe uh, longer months. Um, because some individuals were actually unemployed prior to COVID-19, and and those are the populations we are most concerned about, um, and we we will have um, added. Um, outreach to them as well as case management opportunities to help get them uh, back engaged in the workforce. And I expect that the, the president's um, jobs plan will also have additional um, provisions in it and funding uh, related to uh, workforce development and reemployment efforts as well. You know, for, for the families who are stand to kind of benefit from the dependency addition, I imagine a lot of them are saying, like, why is this computer system standing in the way of my receiving money? Why can't you guys just update the system? It's, uh, it's about a $50 million question, uh, Aaron. I think that's part of the problem. Okay. I think it's just that yeah, it's, it needs saying, to be completely replaced, oh, right? It's not just an addition yeah, yeah, to, the, to the mainframe. It's just a complete... Um, replacement of the mainframe and that's been standing in the way for a number of years we've we've advocated for that um, and in better times you know I, I don't think uh, uh, the legislature saw the need in investing a lot of money in it because there were only uh, a fewer a few thousand people on unemployment um, but as we've seen when you have 30,000 or 90,000 uh, becomes uh, that much more important so we we still believe uh, that the federal government will get involved at some point and uh, and help us out in this way and if not we we have to find the resources to to upgrade this system it's 50 years old okay thank you tim quiston from my business magazine hey governor you know the president has been um, received a lot of pressure on releasing some vaccine for uh, other countries, India and Brazil, and I, I'm suspecting that the state has a lot of PPE surplus it now. Have you talked at all about uh, releasing that, maybe sending it to other places that need it? You know, interesting you brought that up because I was thinking about that this morning uh, and uh, was going to connect with our folks over in uh, public safety about that very issue. If we have uh, some uh, PPE that uh, that uh, we're willing to distribute that we should offer that in some way uh, to help out some of the other countries. So it's timely and uh, something that is on my mind. All right, great. Uh, I look forward to hearing more on that. Uh, as far as the uh, Coffee Cup Bakery Vermont bread issue, is, is Commissioner Harrington, um, are you going to have any um, job fairs or anything for in Burlington, Brattleboro, or anything like that? Is that anything planned yet? Commissioner Harrington or Secretary Curley? Yeah, I wonder if Commissioner Harrington got pulled away. This is Secretary Curley. Uh, the Department of Labor does generally uh, work to do what they call a rapid response and will host, and, and at this point it's probably virtual, but job fairs to the extent they can. I also know we've already connected with um, other employers around the state who have uh, a great deal of openings who have expressed interest in talking with these employees so that is a great sign of hope, as well as um, there are regional development corporations around the state who are all getting together today to try to find a potential buyer for for the uh, company so that you know we can keep Coffee Cup in Vermont and, uh, and operating. So we have a few things that are going on. We all learned of this just recently. It was very abrupt, um, but, but it's all hands on deck. I, and if yeah. I could just add, and I, I sorry, oh, sure. this is Michael Harrington. 
I couldn't get to my unmute button fast enough. Um, but uh, we are, um, our workforce development team is reaching out to the company um, through a direct point of contact uh, and we'll be providing, you know, whether it's um, dedicated job fairs, but also outreach um, for impacted employees in the form of helping them uh, get on unemployment if that's uh, their need or obviously providing additional uh, reemployment services. So uh, we should be making, uh, I believe we're making contact with the company today if we haven't already. All right, great, thanks. Cut me off surprise too. All right, thank you very much. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Uh, no questions today, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. My question, Governor, this is a clarification. Uh, the funding for the Vermont State College system, was there any funds that were also set aside for Community College of Vermont that was for targeted to Northern Vermont uh, university and it was for the whole system ed um it was a i believe the ask was around 70 million uh, but they've received some money from the federal government uh directly so that's been reduced as i remember so i don't know what the what the total is at this point but it's throughout the state college system so that would include community college and the other question I have is a little different, and that is, um, so researchers for MIT uh, announced a study that they did recently that said that social distancing indoors is not going to help prevent uh, the spread, will not in, uh, increase the spread of the disease. It doesn't matter whether you're six feet apart or 60 feet apart, as long as you have a mask on and good ventilation. Is there something that would help change things in terms of opening the economy even more? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Thanks. Uh, I'll say thanks, Ed, but I really, I really want to say I was secretly praying nobody would bring that study up. <laughs> Um, and I have respect for the researchers, respect for the study, and the fact it was published. Uh, it's all very important. But keep in mind, this is now one recent study uh, that we layer al alongside a whole bunch of other studies from the whole pandemic and before. The reality is this was a modeling study, mathematical modeling. Um, and uh, it was not something done in a laboratory with real human beings. And there are many, many studies throughout the pandemic that either rely on mathematical modeling, rely on physical chemistry and uh, physics, um, and are done in a very elegant and sophisticated way, looking at particle sizes, looking at particle velocities, looking at um, distances, all of the things that you'd want to be uh, looked at. And uh, some come up with different conclusions than others. But I have to be very emphatic about this, because um, I come from the world of biomedical research. Even when we see studies that we think are really making a very strong point, it's very hard to apply them to the human population unless you have a, a research um, study that is then done with human beings to either prove the point or not. Uh, so we should, again, put this in our catalog of studies that have been done. This one would make it seem like we wasted our time for the last 14 months wearing masks at all. There's abundant uh, voluminous data that says that's not true. We actually uh, did a lot of uh, protecting of one another by doing this. So just have to be careful that you know we don't just look at a study that comes along that especially is based on modeling and not based on real human experience uh, and draw all of our conclusions from that. We need to weigh it in context with everything else. So I, I don't know anyone that's using that study to, uh, to get to the rest of your question. Uh, pave the way 
uh, through their reopening process and hasten it in any way, uh, that would be very premature, I would think. Okay, thank you very much. Joseph Gresser, Mark Chronicle. Um, thank you. I think this is also for Dr. Levine. Um, I'm curious, last uh, briefing, you remarked that um, it wasn't uh, clear whether the decline in the number of cases among younger people was due to better behavior because it had been seen in other states as well. I'm curious whether uh, there's a possibility that uh, the coronavirus may be seasonal in nature and whether that carries with it the danger that people will see cases diminishing and um, instead of um, getting vaccinated, we'll just assume the problem's over. It's a great question. Um, you know, so far our experience has not been that it's seasonal because it's been with us every season, but of course it's because it's a new virus and there are new populations being exposed to it that have never seen it before. There are a lot of um, infectious disease uh, clinicians who do have the feeling that because it is a respiratory virus and now that we've been through this kind of cycle that we've been through, that it will, in the future, establish itself, itself more as a seasonal virus, meaning like in the flu season when we see most of the respiratory viruses, um, and they sort of die out after that till the next flu season. So there's a distinct possibility that that will happen with this virus. Um, but again, it's going to uh, really depend on a whole bunch of variables, and some of those variables include uh, our behavior all the time, but other variables include the vaccination rate and how successful that is. And probably the most important variable to me right now, which is the most concerning to all of us, is the global picture. Because this virus has now established itself in every continent that I'm aware of, uh, although I haven't heard about Antarctica, so I'm not 100% sure there. but. Um, it's been very much in every other part of the world. And most of the rest of the world, if you exclude a few of the Asian countries and exclude Australia, New Zealand, and some of Europe now, uh, has not had vaccine. Or if they've had vaccine, they've had it in such small amounts that it's going to take a long time for those parts of the world to catch up. And uh, it's great that President Biden has talked about providing vaccine as much as he can to other places. Um, but the reality is there's a lot of catching up to do. So I don't know how quickly this could become a seasonal virus just because uh, it's still causing chaos and havoc uh, in lots of parts of the world. Um, taking on from what you were just saying about uh, the virus in other parts of the world, given um, the situation in India and Brazil in particular, um, does that present um, a real danger that varieties of the virus that are not um, affected by the vaccine's uh, effects um, could emerge? and? So is this one of those things that uh, there could be a kind of rebound effect just because those places are not sufficiently provided with vaccines? Yes, yeah, so the short answer is yes, but I don't want people to get unduly alarmed. Uh, we've often said that the way the, va the virus uh, can develop itself and mutate is dependent on how much transmission there is from one human being to another. 
And the more we let that pattern of transmission occur, the more mutations will occur, the more variant strains will occur. But the good news is the majority of variant strains seen to date are uh, impacted in a favorable way by the vaccine. Uh, and even the one that's the least favorable, the one from South Africa, still has a pretty high rate of uh, becoming uh, responsive to the vaccine, which is great. Um, it's a little too soon to comment on what's going on in India with ever because there's just so many cases there and we don't really know what's going to develop in terms of new strains. Not been told or heard that there are specific strains occurring there now that are of concern, but I think it's a little too soon to state. But again, getting all of this under control worldwide is the key to success for all of us. Thank you very much. And lastly, Greg from the Bennington Banner. Uh, thank you very much. My first com question is for Commissioner Harrington. Uh, Commissioner, did Coffee Cup Bakery slash Vermont Bread Company and or their parent company provide sufficient notice uh, that they were shutting down their operations in Brattleboro and Burlington under state law? Uh, the company and the, the parent company did provide notice yesterday afternoon uh, to both myself and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. While there are provisions under the law regarding timeliness of notice and, and providing prior notice, there are also exceptions under the law, uh, depending on uh, what is occurring within the organization and what the organization is doing to maybe turn a company around. Um, so with that, uh, our legal counsel um, is currently reviewing the warn notices and we'll be having conversations uh, with the company um, to better understand uh, what activities uh, were occurring prior to um, issuing the warn notice to see whether or not um, any of the exemptions apply. Okay. Generally speaking, do you encourage companies to inform their employees when something like this is happening? Because we are hearing that um, employees were, um, uh, were unfortunately taken very much by surprise in this instance. Yeah, and, and I think we would I think we would agree, and I think the company would probably also agree that they would have loved to have been able to give as much notice as possible. I also know that um, uh, when companies are struggling and working on turnaround solutions, um, those are very um, uh, protected pieces of of information. Um, and so you're also not wanting to provide either false hope or false awareness. Uh, of, of a company's, you know, concerns or struggles. Uh, and so uh, from that perspective, I, I think there's what we would always like to be able to do and then what is actually uh, most appropriate given the circumstance. I think in, in general terms, um, we would hope that um, a company not only provide their employees as much notice as possible, but they provide the state as much notice as possible so that we can also not only align our response services, but there may also be opportunities for us to assist the company, um, you know, and, and helping them get over whatever hurdle or struggle they are experiencing. Um, but again, I think it really depends on a, on a case by case basis. Right. And for, for you or for the governor, um, the governor mentioned earlier that uh, he was aware that apparently there were some financial issues at Coffee Cup. What, what were you aware of? Um, and can you, can you at all characterize what those financial issues were? Was it, um, was it uh, capital? Was it sufficient employee, uh, employee base? Was uh, uh, other financial issues you can disclose? Yeah, from my standpoint, I can only say that uh, I'd heard that they had some financial difficulties over the last um, year or so. So I don't have any any particulars, just of what I heard. Okay, uh, Governor. One last question about this very unfortunate and sad situation in Putney. Um, operating a motor vehicle is an adult privilege with serious and sometimes horrible consequences if things go wrong. Uh, we're unfortunately living that reality today. Um, but that said, as a state, we've decided that adult privilege of driving demands accountability and transparency. But we also afford that adult privilege to juveniles where there's different legal standards. So my question is, what should accountability look like for juvenile operators when something very adult and awful like this happens? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, very timely. I think there's a lot of discussion in the legislature at this point in time as to actually increasing the age of, uh, of what we uh, um, consider a juvenile, um, as well as um, expungable crimes and so forth. So um, with, this, uh, with this push uh, that we've seen over the last number of years um, towards uh, uh, justice reinvestment. Uh, I think that this is a, a timely uh, incident in some respects uh, to to contemplate what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. So I expect this will be a topic of discussion in the legislature. Mm -hmm. I mean, but we are talking about, um, you know, a very, a, the worst possible outcome okay. for a situation like this. And um, certainly uh, adult drivers are, you know, who share, for with whom juvenile drivers share the road are not afforded that same consideration if, if, something, um, if something horrible happens to them. Uh, so, I mean, how do you, um, how do we uh, address that seeming double standard? Yeah, well, again, uh, driving is a privilege, um, not a right. So, um, and it's, we should consider it just that. And so, again, this is a a, uh, I believe will be a topic of discussion in the legislature as we move forward with uh, certain aspects of, of what we should be um, allowing and what we shouldn't uh, and what we need to, uh, uh, to highlight further. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay, with that, uh, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you again on Friday.